name's Gemma Holman. Um, I'm the author of Royal Witches from Joan of Navarre to Elizabeth Woodville and I also run the historical blog Just History Posts uh, where I talk about all different aspects of history from all different periods and time places. That's right, today I'm thrilled to be joined by Gemma Holman who's going to take us into 15th century England and show us how royal women, Joan of Navarre, Eleanor Cobham, Jaquetta of Luxembourg, and Elizabeth Woodville were accused of witchcraft. Today, I am thrilled to welcome Gemma Holman, who is the author of this wonderful book, Royal Witches, Witchcraft and Nobility in 15th Century England. And it starts us right in the midst of the time of the Wars of the Roses when everything's changing and people are being threatened and accused of things. And it turns out that was a time of royal witches. And so I'm so excited to have Gemma here with us today. Thank you for coming and welcome, Gemma. Hello. Thank you very much for having me. Let's just jump right into these marvelous women whose stories you tell in your book. And we'll start with Joan of Navarre, so just to remind people, she married Henry IV and became the stepmother. She was his second wife and became the stepmother of the very, very famous Henry V. So she was the queen consort. And then after Henry IV died, she was the queen dowager, a person of power and wealth. And it would seem sort of protected by her close relationship to mm -hmm. the former king and the current king. But tell us what happened, because it didn't turn out to be quite as protected as she might have thought. Yes, yeah, so as you say, after her husband dies, Henry IV, um, she stays in England. Um, so she had ties to various countries in Europe. She'd been Duchess of Brittany. Um, her father was King of Navarre. So there were other territories that she could have gone to, but she stay decided to stay in England, um, probably largely because her wealth and power was based there. But she'd also gained this really close relationship with her stepchildren, uh, the oldest of which, obviously, as you say, became Henry V. And she had this really good relationship and he would refer to her in official government records as his most dear mother, his dearest mother. And he gave her access to his castles to use when he was in France. She could stay in his castles um, and he gave her all these other different sorts of favours. So in the years after Henry IV's death, there's all of these signs that she's a really close member of the family who is cared for deeply by her stepson. Um, but as you say, things shortly take a turn for the worst. And in 1419, um, all of the goods of her personal confessor, sort of her, her private priest, essentially, were confiscated. And the list of goods that were confiscated make it clear that actually most of these objects belonged to Joan. You know, they're gold and silver objects and luxurious bed linen and cushions and things that a priest wouldn't own. Uh, they're all Joan's items. And not too long after he's arrested, he then comes before Parliament and he accuses her of trying to kill the king. And he says, in the most evil and terrible manner imaginable. So it's like I mentioned earlier, the, the charges against Joan are very vague. You know, the Chronicle says that she used evil magic. He says the most evil and terrible manner imaginable. So it's not quite clear what the exact charges are, but clearly she's basically been accused of trying to use witchcraft to kill the king, which is, of course, treason. And this is a really shocking turn of events for this woman who, as you say, she's the queen dowager. She's got this really close relationship with, with the new king. And suddenly she's been accused of trying to kill him. And it doesn't really make any sense because Joan would stand nothing to gain if Henry died because she had had no children with uh, Henry IV. So it's not like any of her children might take over the throne. And as I said, actually, she'd been getting quite a lot of favours from him. So if anything, uh, another king might not give her those things. 
Um, and what it essentially comes down to is Joan's wealth. So when she married Henry IV, she had been given this huge dower, which was basically the, the yearly income that a queen was given to help sustain herself. And it was the largest dower that any English queen had been given up to that point. Uh, it was a huge amount of money, um, over £6,000 a year. And at the time, that was a ninth, about a ninth of the total income of the crown. So everything that the government was being run by, she was getting a ninth of it. So this is a huge amount of money. Uh, you know, to be an earl in England, you only needed to have about two or three thousand pounds a year. So she's getting more than double that. Um, and once Henry V comes to the throne, he decides to restart the wars with France. And war is very, very, very expensive. And he didn't really have any money to start with because his father had spent all the money trying to put down rebellions within their own kingdom. So he sort of starts this war and is being really successful. And he's at a really crucial point where he might be able to claim the throne of France for himself, but he's got no money left. He needs money to pay his soldiers. He needs money to fulfill the treaties with France. The plan is that he's going to marry the French princess. And so he needs lots of money for a big expensive wedding to show how powerful he is, but he's got nothing left. So suddenly Joan's income is looking really attractive because that boost of money will really change his fortunes in his plans. That's amazing. So it just comes right down to money, which is pretty much. Yes. <laughs> As is often the case. <laughs> yeah. And so that was the best way. I mean, it, it, that just seems like a drastic way if you need some money to accuse someone of witchcraft. It is, but in many ways it makes complete sense for the situation. So there were already hints earlier in the year that he might have been trying to borrow some money off of Joan, um, but Joan necessarily didn't have the money to give to him anyway because she'd been having some troubles of her own trying to actually get all of this money that she was owed uh, because the Crown had no money to give her. So it was a bit of a cycle there, really. Um, but it makes perfect sense because the only way they could get the money off of her would be to confiscate all of her goods, all of her income, all of her land. And there's only a few things that you can do that for because she was legally entitled to that money as the Queen Dowager. So Henry can't just say, oh, I'm going to take that back for a little bit. I'll give you some later. That's not legally allowed. And so really the only thing left is to accuse her of treason because treason was one of the few ways that you could justify confiscating everything that someone owns. But to accuse someone of treason is actually quite tricky because you obviously need to have evidence. And especially the fact that she was a woman makes it a lot more difficult because, you know, she was trying to kill the king. She'd need to have soldiers and armies involved who might be plotting to actually kill him, to a surprise attack him, things like that. And suddenly you're looking into this huge web of people that you'd have to implicate. Um, and it just wouldn't be realistic. Whereas if you use the charge of witchcraft, suddenly you only need one or two people to be implicated because it's something that you can do by yourself in secret that nobody would know about. Um, and once you've sort of given that accusation of witchcraft, it's quite hard to prove that you didn't do it because how do you prove you didn't do something? Um, so witchcraft in that sense was actually completely practical to accuse her because it just meant that no one else at court was in danger. You know, they didn't need to implicate any other powerful men at court. They could just go for her and a couple of her servants. And that's astonishing that that accusation, which so easily made, could have such a devastating effect. So thank you for sharing that. That's that's really an amazing choice. Oh, we'll just accuse her of witchcraft. <laughs> However, she was, for having been accused of witchcraft, her treatment, once they got the money, the treatment of her was fairly gentle in comparison to some of the other accusations of witchcraft. So does that say to you that they really knew she was not guilty of witchcraft? Or and I guess what I'm asking is, did they believe it? Or was it simply a convenient tool to use to go after her money? Yeah, I mean, there's, I think that there's loads of evidence that shows that this was a completely political accusation, that it was completely fabricated. And actually, I think there's a fair bit of evidence that shows that even at the time, 
no effort was made to make it look convincing and that probably most people didn't believe it was true anyway. Um, so I mentioned about the chronicles sort of talking about it. So you have this one chronicle that mentions the, the dark magic, but a couple of the other chronicles just say that she was arrested. They don't even mention what the charges were. They just say, oh yeah, and, and Queen Joan was arrested. And then some of the chronicles don't even mention it at all. Um, and so this kind of raises a bit of an eyebrow, particularly when you look at Eleanor Cobham, who's later in the century, every single chronicle that's written in England during the time of Eleanor's trial mentions it. And it mentions it in loads of detail. It's a huge scandal. It's a huge piece of gossip. Everybody's talking about it, rightly so, because someone's tried to kill the king with magic. This is huge. And so the fact that even the chronicles either don't mention it or barely mention it is in itself a really big red flag that, well, actually, why is no one talking about this? Do they not think it's a big deal? And if they don't think it's a big deal, clearly they don't think that it's true. And then, as you say, when you turn and look at Joan's treatment, it becomes really clear that actually, yeah, these are false. There's there's no effort being made to make her look guilty. So all of her goods and lands are confiscated for the government's use. But she's put in quite honourable confinement. You know, she's put in quite nice palaces and castles. The place that she spends most of her time in prison is Leeds Castle. Um, and this had been a castle owned by previous queens of England. Um, and so it was quite quite a nice and luxurious castle to be in. And obviously she's confined there. She doesn't have her freedom. But the setting itself is certainly quite luxurious. She's given lots of servants. She's allowed to buy gifts for her servants. She's got, you know, her, her bird is with her and she's got silver candlesticks and she's got horses and she's allowed to go riding. And so you sort of put all these things together and you go, well, those aren't really luxuries that you give to someone that you think's tried to kill the king. You know, no matter their status, even if she's a queen or not, you don't sort of give her all of these things. Um, and, you know, just as telling is that she receives various visitors during her time in prison. Um, and these are really powerful men. So Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, her stepson, he comes to visit her numerous times. Uh, you have Bishop Beaufort, who was the half brother of her previous husband, Henry IV. He's, you know, half brother to the king. He's a very powerful bishop who becomes a cardinal. Um, he's got really important positions in government. Um, you know, some of the highest positions you can be, he holds over his lifetime. Um, and so he comes to visit her as well. And on top of that, you have the Archbishop of Canterbury comes and has dinner with her. So all of these people, they're not going to be visiting a witch who's tried to kill the king. You know, certainly not the Archbishop of Canterbury, you know, the highest member of the church in England isn't going to be condoning this behaviour. Um, so when you have a look at the fact that no one's reporting it, she's in really quite luxurious circumstances, you know, given the accusations she's under, and she's constantly receiving really high status guests. As I said, none of this screams that she's guilty or that they're even trying to make it look like she's guilty. Um, and on top of all of that, she's actually never put on trial. So no proper evidence is ever brought against her. There's no trial. She's never judged guilty. Um, and again, that's quite a telling uh, thing that actually these were false accusations. That is fascinating when you unpick it like that. And we can see that mainly they're just after your money and then we'll put mm -hmm. you here in this very nice place and you can have all these very fancy visitors. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's a really interesting contrast to the next woman in your book that we come to and that you mentioned, Eleanor Cobham, who is treated very differently and is um, isolated and, and the focus on her is really quite dramatically different. So one of the things I thought was interesting about Eleanor is that she is um, identified and actually used by Shakespeare. You know, many of these women, we don't really hear much about her. We don't hear much about these accusations, but she's one that, you know, kind of makes it to the Shakespeare play. Um, and so the notion of, of him grabbing and gravitating on her, and if we look at some of the ways she is treated, this seems like a more serious accusation with more people really looking to prove guilt. So can you tell us about that? So we've had an example of someone who, well, they're just mainly after her money and there's not really much attempt to prove her guilty. It's very different with Eleanor. So tell us about that. 
Yes, yeah, so um, Eleanor was actually a sort of slightly lower class woman. She was the daughter of um, a knight um, and sort of her ancestors had been quite quite big at court um, the previous century. You know, one of her ancestors had been a knight of the garter, um, but they'd sort of slipped down the rungs of nobility somewhat. But obviously in the grand scheme of the whole society, she was actually quite high up. Um, but in terms of the hierarchy of the court, she was certainly a lesser woman. Um, and during the 1420s, she becomes the mistress of Humphrey, Duke of Gloucester, so Joan's stepson. And eventually um, Humphrey's first marriage basically is a big disaster, um, gets annulled by the Pope, and Humphrey immediately takes this opportunity to marry Eleanor, his mistress. So they've basically married for love. She's a much lower status than him. She doesn't bring any lands or money. She's been his mistress. And they've then been able to have this sort of happy ending. Um, but Humphrey, as I said, was one of these really powerful people at court. He's one of the princes of England. Um, and by the time the sort of 1430s come in, all of his older brothers have died. He was the, the youngest son. And so he's the uncle to the child king, Henry VI. But, you know, at this time, he is still a child. You know, he's barely in his teens by the end of the decade. And so he could easily die. You know, he was not married. He doesn't have any children of his own. And if that happens, then Humphrey would become king of England. So Eleanor's now married to the heir to the throne. So she's had this really huge rise. But the problem is... Humphrey is part of a faction at court um, that is against Bishop Beaufort, who I mentioned earlier with Joan. And these two men have very different characters, very different personalities and very different ideas of how the court should be run. And they're constantly fighting with each other. They're constantly trying to get one up on each other. Humphrey will find out something bad that Beaufort did. And so Beaufort will be removed from government, but then he'll get back in because he's got lots of money that the government needs. And then he'll do something to sort of slightly oust uh, Humphrey. So it's this kind of real back and forth. And by the time you get to about 1440, Beaufort's faction is kind of growing more supporters and these people basically want to end the war with France. They've decided it's too much money, they're losing, they don't have these huge glorious battles like the days of Agincourt and they just want to kind of have everything tied up so that they can just focus on their own country and give things up. Uh, but Humphrey is completely opposed to this. You know, he was there at Agincourt when he was a teenager. He saw this big victory uh, when his brother was dying on his deathbed. He promised him that he would champion, you know, his son's claim to the French throne. And so he doesn't want to give in. You know, he it stands against everything that he believes in. So you sort of have these two different opposing views at court. And Humphrey st starts to become a bit of an inconvenience, really. Most people at court are starting to, to go against his views and they're starting to gain influence over the young king. Um, but the young king loves Humphrey. You know, he's his uncle. He loves Eleanor. They're close family members and he does listen to him quite a lot. So the other faction at court decides that they need to get rid of Humphrey somehow so that they can be the only person with influence over Henry. If they get rid of Humphrey, then they can get everything that they want at court. But as I said, he's a prince of England. He's the heir to the throne. So there's not really anything you can do against him, particularly when Henry is so enamoured with him and giving him gifts and, you know, really loves him as a close family member. And this is basically where Eleanor comes in. And you mentioned it briefly earlier. There's this idea in this period that your reputation is intertwined with people around you, particularly your family members. So if one of your family members has done something bad, you know, if they've committed treason, that automatically shows on you as well. And now you're a bit suspect because, well, they're part of your family, so maybe you're questionable as well. And so the idea seems to have sort of sprung up that, well, maybe if we attack Eleanor and bring Eleanor down, then that's going to shake Henry's confidence in Humphrey. And that's going to knock him off of this pedestal just enough that we can then get our own way. And having seen, you know, just sort of two decades earlier, the success of these accusations against Joan, the idea sort of clearly comes about, well, maybe we can do something similar with Eleanor. Because just like I said with Joan, you can't really just accuse them of normal crimes because women weren't in the government so they can't say ellen has been giving bad advice or ellen has been raising armies against the king because these aren't things that women can do but women can do witchcraft and so it's quite an easy solution 
Right. And again, they had that example, but against Eleanor, it just seemed to be more serious. It was taken more seriously. It was targeting her in a more serious way. So what made it a different outcome? Because, you know, Joan really weathers it and sort of comes out the other end and Henry V apologizes on his deathbed to her and mm -hmm. all is well. That doesn't happen with Eleanor. It's a very different outcome. So what are some of the differences that lead her to that worse outcome? So the differences basically lie in the different intent of the accusations. So with Joan, the intent was just to take her money and use her money for a certain period of time so that they could get everything done that they needed to do. But as I said, you know, she had genuinely been cared for by her stepchildren. They did genuinely like her and love her. And so although they wanted her money and they were cruel enough to take that from her by force, they also didn't actually want to cause permanent harm to her. You know, they didn't want her to be executed for treason or, you know, be permanently damaged by this. And that's part of the reason why she's never put on trial, because it means they can keep her things. But she never gets tarred with this brush of, yes, you've been found guilty of trying to do this terrible crime and so once the government no longer needs her money they can just sort of set her free and she can be restored and it's all fine so she's basically protected by the fact that it's the government doing this against her but the government is still kind of on her side whereas with Eleanor there's a completely different intent there so the intent with Eleanor is to destroy her and in doing so destroy Humphrey and there's a big faction of court that are clearly sort of working towards this goal and so the fact that they managed to gather some accomplices that are supposed to have helped her with it and they're willing to testify that they did witchcraft for her and she instructed them to. It's a lot more vicious and the fact is that Henry VI is completely convinced by the evidence brought before him. You know, he completely 100% believes that Eleanor did try to kill him and, you know, he pays priests to say prayers to protect him from witchcraft and evil magic. And, you know, he, he, he definitely believes that this has happened. And so this time, you know, the king isn't on her side. The king thinks that she did do it and truly believes this. And so that just means that she's going to get fully persecuted. And for their purposes, they need a trial. You know, they need it to be proven that she did this because otherwise nothing will happen if it's found that, oh, no, it didn't really happen. It was a misunderstanding. Then they're not going to achieve their outcome. They need her to be found guilty so that Humphrey is then placed under suspicion himself. Because if his wife has been trying to commit treason, you know, maybe he was in on it as well. Um, so, yeah, it's really that different intent on what the nature of the attack is and what the out desired outcome is that really makes the attacks on Eleanor uh, so much more extreme. Right. And ultimately, those attacks really do shift the power balance in England. They are successful, if you want to look at it that way, mm -hmm. in condemning her and through that condemning Humphrey and shifting that power and getting uh, Henry VI on board with their different goals. And it's, it's quite a fascinating thing. So staying in that sort of realm of the Wars of the Roses and looking at these women, which you know, we don't often, as you mentioned earlier, we don't often remember how important they are. We we know Marguerite and, and some of the others, but Eleanor may not get all of the attention that she really deserves, but there are a couple more that you, you bring us in your book, a mother-daughter team. They're made into a bit of a team. And what some people might not realize is that witchcraft is invoked as Richard III, someone we often hear about, quite a bit about, mm -hmm. but that witchcraft is invoked as rich, as one of the reasons that Richard III positions himself as the rightful king of England. So can you tell us about Jaquetta of Luxembourg, whom you mentioned earlier, and her daughter, Elizabeth Woodville, and how all of that comes together? Yeah, so again, with, with sort of starting with Jaquetta, you really see the closeness of these women to each other. Um, that was something that had, had always struck me that sort of 
when these cases had been dealt with in the past in journal articles or books, they're, they're all treated as really discrete cases that aren't connected. But as I mentioned, you know, Joan was stepmother to Humphrey, who then marries Eleanor. So Eleanor is sort of her stepdaughter-in-law kind of thing. Um, but another one of Joan's um, stepsons was the Duke of Bedford. And Jaquetta of Luxembourg marries him. So again, she's a sort of half steps stepchild you know stepdaughter-in-law of Joan and her and Eleanor are sort of sisters via marriage um so they're at court at the same time they all overlap they all knew each other they all would have spent Christmases together and Jaquetta of Luxembourg was part of this sort of noble family um, in Europe. So she was descended from the sort of rulers of Luxembourg. She had ties to the French throne. Uh, she had ties to various other sort of noble and royal families in Europe. So she was a, a woman of very good blood, um, obviously so because she marries uh, the Duke of Bedford, who at the time was the heir again to Henry VI. He was Humphrey's older brother, so he took precedence. So if fate had gone differently, again, Jaquetta could have become queen. So both Jaquetta and Eleanor are right there, you know, very senior women in the royal family. Um, but Jaquetta is widowed very young. She's only a teenager when she marries Bedford and he's a lot older than her. And he dies about two years or so into their marriage. And so she ends up remarrying to this young knight called Richard Woodville. Um, and this is when you then get the Woodville family and their oldest daughter is Elizabeth Woodville, who you mentioned as well. And they get tied up in the Wars of the Roses because the Woodvilles are initially really loyal servants of Henry VI and Margaret of Anjou. Uh, they both served in government. Uh, Jaquetta served as sort of lady in waiting, was very close to Margaret. And Richard Woodville was a very trusted advisor and uh, sort of military man for Henry VI. So they're very loyal to the them. Um, but as the sort of tables turn in the Wars of the Roses and Henry and Margaret are ousted from the country and you get Edward IV become King of England under the Yorkist house, the couple decide to realign to the Yorkist side because basically their option is to flee the country with their 12 children or, you know, make up with this new regime. And so the answer for them is, is kind of obvious. And through these sort of twists and turns and various sort of plotting and planning, somehow Elizabeth ends up marrying Edward IV, uh, which is a real shock at the time, because although Jaquetta was of really high status, because Richard was a much lower status, he was just a knight, Elizabeth herself was seen to be of a lot lower status than her mother. So though her mother could marry a potential king of England, she wasn't seen as worthy to marry a king. But despite this, you know, they get married, they have uh, this very happy long marriage together. Um, and through various, again, through various plots that happen at court, um, Jaquetta gets accused of using witchcraft, potentially against the king and queen, sort of suggestions of maybe using love magic to make that shock marriage happen. Um, and this happens at a time when Edward IV is being held captive by his cousin Warwick, uh, who's known as the Kingmaker because he had helped Edward come to the throne. And so Warwick is at this time quite against the Woodvilles and wants to get rid of them so that he can have more influence at court. So he's using the same tactic that they used against Eleanor. You know, they want more influence against the king, so they'll throw out that accusation of witchcraft. Now, luckily, Jaquetta comes out of it unscathed because Edward manages to regain power. And so obviously he helps out his mother-in-law. And so Jaquetta kind of comes out of it not too worse for wear. But this idea is that once those accusations of witchcraft are out there, they can never be taken back. And these rumours continue to swirl across the country over the coming years until, as you say, Richard III seizes the throne for himself. And although he's got power, although he's been made king, and although Edward's sons, the princes in the tower, have mysteriously vanished, he still needs to come up with a sort of legal document to explain why he was king rather than Edward's sons. And the easiest way to do this is to say that um, Eleanor, uh, sorry, Elizabeth and Edward's marriage was invalid, and that would mean that their children were illegitimate and so they couldn't inherit the throne. So he comes up with this big old list of reasons. There's lots of reasons given as to why the marriage was invalid. None of them would really hold up um, in a proper sort of 
a proper assessment of an annulment, but he kind of just lists them just for the sake of listing them. And amongst this list is this claim that, as everybody in the kingdom knows, Jaquetta and Elizabeth used witchcraft against the king to make him fall in love with her. And so there's this idea that if they've used magic to make him fall in love with her, then he hasn't married her of his own free will. He's been coerced. And that's one of the reasons uh, that you could get a marriage annulled um, in the medieval period, that marriage could be judged as illegal if one of the parties has been forced into it. And so this this idea that he says, you know, as everybody knows, it just shows that those rumours from Jaquetta that had been brought up beforehand had just continued to stir in the kingdom. And maybe people didn't really believe it, but the fact that the rumours were out there were just something that he could seize upon and then use for his own gains years later. That's really interesting. Now, did he offer any evidence or was it once again just this accusation made for the sense of an accusation? Yeah, I mean, he he basically admits it really in the ordinance. So as I said, he sort of starts it saying, as everybody knows, and then he sort of says, if evidence needs to be provided at some point, then we'll come up with it. <laughs> and that's basically it. So, you know, they're not even really trying to make it that convincing. He's basically saying, well, we don't need evidence because everybody know they did it. But, you know, if you really want some, we could come up with something. You know, that's kind of the impression you get from it. Um, and so, yeah, it's just really interesting. But part of the point is he doesn't need to make it convincing. You know, he's got the power. He's been made king. There's no sons of Edward around who can challenge him and claim the throne. So as I said, this is more a formality at this point, rather than needing to be a really calculated attack and really prove, yes, they did witchcraft. And so the marriage is illegal. You know, it's just a formality at this point. And so he just doesn't even need to bother making it convincing. So after that point, after he's on the throne and he's had all this published and he says, see, so it's all clear to you all that I'm the king, so stop asking about it. <laughs> Are there further issues for Jaquetta or for Elizabeth um, related to accusations of witchcraft? No, not really. So um, Jaquetta had actually died by this point. So the initial okay. accusations against her had been proven false. Um, and this had been published in Parliament, they had done an investigation into it. And basically, the witnesses fell apart. Um, and it became very clear that these accusations had been made up. Um, but because Jaquetta had seen firsthand what happened to Eleanor, you know, she was very cautious about this. And so she has it recorded on the Parliament rolls, you know, it says that Jaquetta wants this recorded for posterity. So it's clear that she's pushing for this, that, you know, these accusations were false, and they were only there to try and harm her name. And because, you know, she was the mother in law of the king, and the king was in power, and he favoured her, just like with Joan, she had no more issues after that point, because the king's on her side. And so no one's going to be able to say otherwise. So it's only then once the king's dead and, you know, Elizabeth is unprotected that these accusations can come up again. But as I said, you know, Richard didn't need to make this ac accusation convincing. So there's no investigation into whether this is real or not. She's not put on trial simply because there's no need. You know, at that point, you again, you're, at that point, you're just being cruel and there's no real need for it. Um, so she is kind of left alone, um, particularly because she and her daughters can be quite useful for Richard's regime. You know, he wants to bring them back into the court so that everybody who followed them were reconciled to his regime. So actually, again, it would be quite bad for him if he did put her on trial and find her guilty and have all of the fallout of that. So she's never put on trial, they're never investigated. And actually, once Richard III um, is killed at the Battle of Bosworth and Henry Tudor comes to the throne, he basically undoes all of this because he's promised everybody that he's going to marry Elizabeth's oldest daughter, who's also called Elizabeth. Um, and in doing so, he's going to sort of reconcile the old Yorkist regime. He's going to bring everybody together. There'll be peace and harmony. And so if he's going to marry this woman, then he needs her to be legitimate. 
So he basically undoes Richard's proclamation and says, yeah, that was never true. The marriage was legal. The children are are legitimate. And now I'm going to marry one of them. Um, And after that point, it never gets mentioned again. You know, there's there's no real other mention of it. Um, It only comes up again, you know, later on when the Tudor chroniclers start writing about everything that happened in Richard's uh, Richard's time and they sort of mention some of the accusations he made against her um, so they talk about a meeting that he had with his council where he supposedly said that Elizabeth had withered his arm but all of this is very much tied into Tudor propaganda because now that we've actually got Richard's skeleton and that was discovered under that fateful car park you know we've been able to study his body and see actually he never had a withered arm nobody at the time claimed he did it was only the Tudors who said so so the idea that he claimed Elizabeth had withered his arm via witchcraft again is clearly uh, an invention by those Tudor chroniclers but you know it does show that there was still word out about what had happened that the idea that he had accused her of witchcraft still existed into the Tudor period um, but it was clearly not taken seriously you know even the chroniclers say well, the people at the council were really confused because they knew that he always had a withered arm. So how could Elizabeth have done that? So, you know, even then when they are mentioning it, they're kind of making it clear no one believes it. It was obviously false. So, yeah, Elizabeth and Jaquetta both managed to come out these accusations fairly unscathed. Right. But Richard had still used those accusations to bolster his claim to the throne mm-hmm. and didn't apparently didn't really hesitate to whatever it does to their reputation is fair game in his world in his world so this is really an interesting look at the different ways these women were attacked and in some cases like Eleanor very violently attacked and destroyed and in other cases just used I mean these attacks were Mm -hmm. used to get what they wanted and then people just kind of moved on it's a fascinating idea of witchcraft and what that represented and the potency of that accusation. We really start to get the idea that these women's lives were seen as, seen as expendable. And it's really a fascinating way to consider this way that they were used to promote the power of men. Looking at these four women is a marvelous way of reexamining the role and the power and the vulnerability of women during this period. Thank you, Gemma, so much for being here and sharing so much information and insight and all these great details and stories that we may not be as familiar with, but now we are. So thank you. Tell us where we can find you and what's to come. So tell us where we can find you. Yes, yeah, so my uh, my blog that I run is called Just History Posts. So you can just find that on Google, and that's the blog where I do my sort of more in depth uh, posts. Um, I also have a Facebook and a Twitter account for the blog, um, and I post daily smaller snippets there where I'll sort of share interesting places or objects or dresses and things like that, um, as well as my uh, sort of longer blog posts. Um, and if you're on Twitter, I also have my own author account, which is Gemma H Author, um, and that's where I'll sort of also talk about history and writing and what kinds of things I'm researching um, with sort of occasional cat pictures or food pictures <laughs> interspersed in as well, if, if that uh, if that takes your fancy. <laughs> all right. Well, that's that's wonderful. And I will have all of these links in the show notes. Is there anything you're working on now, Gemma, that you can tell us about that we can look forward to? Yeah, so I'm actually uh, very close to a manuscript deadline at the moment for my next book, um, which I'm writing about, which again is sort of looking at royal women and women in the court in power, um, but sort of the the previous century. So looking at the court of Edward III, um, and that's due to come out if I finish on time, <laughs> that's <laughs> due to come out uh, towards the end of next year. So uh, yeah, definitely keep an eye sort of on my website and my social media to sort of a bit more information about that when when I'm able to give it. <laughs> oh, that is fantastic. And I certainly hope you'll come back and talk to us about that because Definitely. that would be <laughs> wonderful to, I think, as you said at the very beginning, we really do need to learn more about these women. I know there are a lot of battles going on and there are <laughs> a lot of men fighting, but I really think we need these women's stories. So thank you, Gemma, so much. It has been wonderful to have you here. And I have to say it has been such a 
fun to talk about witches. I don't know if it's appropriate to say that, but <laughs> it has been. <laughs> so thank, thank you. you thank very you much. So Thanks much. for having me. It's been great. Thank you. for joining us for that wonderful discussion with Gemma Holman about witches and witchcraft in the 15th century. And if you want more of Gemma, there are some wonderful tidbits of exclusive content for patrons. So if you're not a patron yet, please take a look and join our Royals, Rebels, and Romantics patron family. I'll see you next week. And let's keep shaking up history together.